Greetings, ladies and Mandeljets, and welcome to this latest episode of uh, Tales, Tales from, from Outer from space. Out space. Out space, where I take a space-related story from around the internet and read it out loud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Please don't forget to do the usual YouTube gumph, because if you don't, the nanite swarms will steal your other sock. But more importantly, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I'd quickly like to thank the following Tier 5 patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Data Magnet and Bob the Dragon. Thank you very much. Humanity Uncovered, written by Lux Loser. Cass Ilyorn looked around the Lewis Sander Tennyson spaceport with a mix of annoyance and boredom. Earth was certainly beautiful from orbit, in a way that was far different and yet as equally pleasing to his beloved Jünger. But he doubted it would hold any of the excitement. Exiting the grey utilitarian structure, he had docked his shuttle in. Cass was taken off guard by the size of the city that sprawled before him. Veldstadt Ranging was not called the Jewel of Humanity for nothing, it seemed. From the spaceport, which was situated higher than most other buildings, he could see the vast majority of the city, with the magnificent Chaldean Sea crashing against one side, the Saharan jungle prowling along the fringes on the other. Skyscrapers jutted up into the heavens, while large parks and recreational centers were visible between the cool steel of its structures most in the Changlu style, being cubic and bland before being broken up by sections made of tall pillars with intricate metalwork and statues, all topped with the tiered roofs that flared up with eaves, a synthesis of modernist, neoclassical, and Chinese architecture. Though, of course, Cass didn't know that. And between every building was a literal swarm of humans, flowing along the grid patterns of streets and walkways like electricity through circuits. No city in Kyrian compared to Valren, as its inhabitants called it. Being limited by the archipelagan nature of Jünger's land masses, Kars quickly shook away any awe that had crept up into his slitted, sulfuric yellow eyes. He was there for a purpose, after all, and ogling the human city would do nothing to progress it. Said purpose was investigation of human history for cataloging in the new galactic encyclopedia of sapien species which had not yet been updated since humans had become a member of the galactic community nearly a hundred years prior. Despite the honor and importance of the task, however, it was not one he brandished. Not that Cass disliked humans. Quite the opposite, he found them friendly and clever, but with a sense of honor and morals that made them dependable. Not to mention that bipedalism, life birth, and use of memories made them far more relatable species than the Kyrian and the Cult Tag, especially when compared to the anthropod Vashimasai, centered soul, and the asymmetrically forming swarms, Luva Anoix. Although, in Cass's opinion, the lack of scales was disturbing at times. Ultimately, what made Cass hesitant was how boring he found the humans to be. The aforementioned traits had made them a predominantly mercantile species. The rash individualism, a trait that had driven the soul to split into three states, making them competitive and innovative. And the ease of learning languages in general, respect for cultural differences, was what made nearly every modern treaty negotiated by humans. Thus, while his colleagues Thrun, Tyre, and Kaios were each learning about a uniquely violent but brutal soul state, the Dion was getting herself likely screwed silly by a swarm of Luvernoix. Cass was, at his estimation, going to sip some juice while reading about endless decades of civilization building and cooperation by humans. Cass did admit that he couldn't quite be certain of what to expect. Humans, despite all their positives, remained a fairly xenophobic society. Not hateful, but guarded viewing other species with great curiosity, but keeping their own secrets close to their chest. This was doubly true of their government, the so-called Confederation of All Humanity, whose delegates to the Galactic National Forum were fond of making vague allusions without elaborating a true meaning. Cass had theorized this was due to other species being so more warlike and divisive, humans thus being happy to mediate conflict, 
but less trusting of those involved in that conflict. Their government did agree to a full examination of human history for the encyclopedia, however, so progress had obviously been made. Cars boarded the sleek red shuttle that would take him to a building called the Cure to Government, where the Confederation's leadership gathered. While aboard the vessel, a small human child, skin tanned and hair a curled mess, pointed at him and asked her mother if the purple dinosaur man was Barney, a common nickname for the Korean amongst humanity. Cars put a note at the back of his mind to also investigate its origin, as the child's sibling said it was clearly not a dinosaur, but a crocodile. Once he arrived at his destination, Cars was quick to remove his leather jacket. The heat injured walking from the spaceport to the air-conditioned shuttle being just barely tolerable. But the long walk from the shuttle station up to the marble steps of the capital was too much for him. As such, he walked along with it draped it over his arm. His torso bare sands a sort of orange sash that denoted him as a GNF official. Being an average cure, he was a hulking figure amongst the smaller humans. At seven and a half feet tall, with a musculature like that of humanity's most accomplished bodybuilders. Of course, the reason for why some human women and men began putting their collars and fanning themselves as he walked past was lost in cars. Once, finally, within the building, Sweat slipped out from the gaps between the scales on his head and neck, quickly wiped away with a handkerchief from his pocket. Cass approached the sort of desk where a human man sat, typing away. He was a standard human of the singular ethnicity, skin being a deep brown, dark hair coiling up at the ends, jaw squared and cleft, eyes slanted and dark, nose aquiline at the bridge, but why at the nostrils? Arising not long before the discovery of the other sapient life, the singular ethnicity was the most prominent in modern day, a singularity of all other major ethnic groups. Seen Cass, the man named Tab marking him as John in both human letters and forum phonetic script, barely batted an eye. How may I help you? He said cheerily in a fairly perfect yawk, the standard language of the cure. I have an appointment, Investigator Carcillion, with the Encyclopedic Commission. All right, just a moment. Ah, yes, right in time. Uh, take that elevator to the top floor. The Administrator Natana will be in our office. Right, thank you, Cars replied before he entered the designated loft. He was thankfully alone as he doubted many humans would fit comfortably inside the box with him. As the thing lurched upwards, he recalled that upon translation, he was surprised to find that the Confederation's head had such a humble title. Even its other officials had titles like Supreme Director and Chief Officer and High Overseer. But the human meritocracy made little sense to Cass. The guy's oligarchic republic being the only mode of government that he truly understood. The write-up was too quick for him to think too much and he exited to find a corridor lined with paintings. Ignoring them, he walked straight to the door ahead, and he entered after the light knock. The room was circular, lined with bookcases, the back wall was of glass, and four portraits hung at even intervals. The first was of a man of similar features to a singular, but with rounder eyes and hair of a shade lighter, Federico Vergara, the first administrator of the Confederation. After him was a woman with the darkest skin cast had ever seen on a human. Her pra named her Taya Maedit, second administrator, and the first to be Luna Born. After her was easily the most famous administrator, Louis X. Tennyson, a man who was the epitome of singular ethnicity aside from his piercing green eyes, who famously shook hands with the Choltag ambassador sent by the GNF. Lastly was Kangler Werner, the extremely popular previous administrator, Luna Born Singular, killed in a tragic pirate encounter while traversing salt space. And that left Marinda Nutana, the woman sitting in front of him. She suffered from albinism, Cass had learned, explaining why, despite having feminine singular features, her skin was almost purely white, and her hair much the same. 
She looked up at him with her blue eyes, though encircled by puffy, almost pink eyelids, full of fiery determination. Carsilion, welcome to Earth and welcome to Valron, she said in Yuck. Thank you, Administrator, for welcoming me, and I apologize for having you speak in my tongue. I would have just transitioned to yours, but Esperanto is difficult for my mouth, and my mission here requires clarity and careful communication. It is more than all right, Sanjara Ilion. Now, while well, I will be authorizing you to see our histories in the archives below, I wanted to answer some of your surface-level questions myself. I, um, all right. Should we simply begin? Yes, go right ahead. Well, um, what would you deem as the most prominent events in human history? Those will likely be where I start my research. Hmm. Well, I will exclude first contact, as that is well-known event to the galaxy. Of course, in that case, going chronologically, I would say the first is the Renaissance, a period of cultural revival after years of chaos and regression following the collapse of a prominent empire. Renaissance. I'll have to ask for transcribing of that, he says, though he does not say his lack of shock that the first event is a cultural flourishing. Then there is the Enlightenment, a movement in politics and philosophy that began to examine new forms of political and scientific thought, followed by the Industrial Revolution, a period of technological progress, as we moved into steam and early combustion engines for power, as well as early harnessing of electricity. No right in the Enlightenment and Industrial Revolution. More cultural and peaceful progress. Truly a shock. Next, um, the French Revolution, which occurs right amidst the Industrial Revolution. Is that another cultural jump? Cass cut in. No, the administrator said with a bit of a smirk. It was a violent rebellion by peasants and the intellectuals against the absolute monarchy, in which many innocent and not-so-innocent lives were lost to public executions, political imprisonment, government purges, and warfare. That, uh, that was unexpected. And this established your current regime, or provided a basis for it? He asked tentatively. Oh, certainly not. It merely destabilized the established political system between competing states and threw the most influential region in the world into decades of war and turmoil. Carsa's silent digesting of the information led her to continue. After that, I suppose there are the world wars... World Wars. Yes, three to be precise. The First World War, or the Great War, was the result of a conflict between a series of alliances. Advancing technology, coupled with outdated tactics, led to the loss of millions of lives to what culminated in little gain on either side. Vindictive diplomacy in peace negotiations, coupled with an economic crisis, resulted in radicals seizing power in several nations and the Second World War, the Vengeful War, saw even more death and destruction, with millions killed not just in combat but in systemic genocide. It was finally ended after the last opponent of the losing side was hit with two atomic bombs. And finally, about a century later, despite a build-up of nuclear weaponry, advancing defensive systems had rendered them useless, and so when tensions between two power blocks reached ahead, Traditional warfare took over, with, once again, millions caught in the crossfire until finally a stalemate was called and both sides were given minor gains that left all unhappy. The resulting chaos and murderous civil wars are what allowed for the ideology of equalism to become established, and eventually, as proponents of it seized control of nations, it resulted in the slow unification of the human race after a few more minor wars. Gar sat there, taken back, though he had not stopped taking any notes. After a full minute of silence, he spoke. I uh, did not expect such a bloody history. I expected as much. Humans have certainly kept it rather well hidden. The administrator frowned. Teach that your legacy is war, and there will be war. Teach that your legacy is peace, and there will be peace. Admin Tennyson spoke those words when he established our policy of reclusiveness. 
We wanted to establish humanity as peaceful, useful, and influential species before revealing how we got to that point, lest we be seen as violent and chaotic. Remember that our first meeting was with the Chalt Tag. And they are infamous for being judgmental, Kars said, slowly understanding. The Silver Bipeds had even quarantined the car at first contact, terrified of a species that had only just ended a long period of oppressive theocratic rule. On that, we can agree. It was the Cholt Ambassador, luckily a liberal xenophile, who actually first suggested we not immediately reveal our histories to his fellows until we had made a good impression. Admin Tennyson decided to extend that idea further. But now you feel the time is right. Certainly. Not only are we trusted and respected, but with pirates encroaching from Korean and Seoul space to our colonies, we feel it is time to reveal that humanity is not a species of pacifists and pushovers. It'll also mean our new fleet will be far more feared. New fleet? Cass asked, alarmed. The Grand Navy of the Confederation, she said proudly with a nod. I believe it will be approximately double the size of the Seoul Imperium's fleet, and so nearly triple that of the Chalt Tag when it's finished. It'll be entirely defensive and peacekeeping, of course, and will work under and with the Foreign Federated Fleet. And I assume it'll be ready with the Encyclopedia Commission debuts through the updated Encyclopedia in two years. New Tana only grinned. Cars did the Kaya equivalent as he realized his research was going to be far more interesting than he had thought. Is there anything else that I should tell you before I set you loose on the archives? Just one, Ambassador. What is it? Why do your humans call the Kier Barney? The galactic community should thus be glad that humanity has set aside its destructive methods or their potential for conquest and war is nearly unmatched, as seen in the histories. Let them be seen as proud warriors turning to being peacekeepers, a fact that the galaxy will ever be thankful for. Humanity Galactic Encyclopedia of Sapiens Species, 6th edition. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.